Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our product management careers panel today. My name is Yuka, and I'm very excited to be your moderator for this event. I'm currently working as a summer intern for Millie, and I'm in the middle of completing my A-levels at an international school here in Thailand. For those of you who are tuning into a Millie event for the first time, Millie is a company dedicated to building a global community for international school students. And to that end, we host webinars and panels like this every weekend. You can find an archive for all our past events, as well as a schedule for future events on our website at www.milligroup.com. And if you want to keep up to date with what we have to offer, follow us on Instagram at Millie underscore group. So here is how today's panel is going to look. We have some pre-prepared questions, but again, you can always submit your own questions. The first 45 minutes or so, we'll go through the prepared questions, and after that, we'll let our panelists answer your questions. Your questions can be general questions for everyone, or you could direct it to a specific panelist, either is fine. All right, so let's get started then. So let's begin with a brief introduction from our panelists. Could you please tell us your name, where it's home for you, and maybe one fun fact about yourself? Let's start with Nina. Hi, my name is Nina. Uh, for the past 30 years, home has been wherever my, I lay my head at, and it's been, I've worked and lived in more than 15 countries, but at the moment I call home, I call home uh, Great Britain. I live in London. I'm originally from Sofia, Bulgaria. And one fun fact about me is that I'm currently vo volunteering and product managing at the small planetarium on the Isle of Wight, where the owner is an 86 years old, original product management manager from IBM. So highly qualified. Um, and one of these really rare uh, 60 years ago people called product managers. So I enjoy comparing notes with him um, and it's very interesting. Oh, we can continue with Nabil. Okay. Hey, everyone. My name is Nabil. Uh, like me now, uh, it's been a long time since I left my home. So now I call US my home and I'm joining from Atlanta, US. One fun fact about me is uh, that I love to play water polo. I don't know how, how many of you uh, know about that sport, but I play that sport professionally. Okay, I believe it's my time. Hi, everybody. My name is Dario. Nice to meet you all. So uh, I'm based in London. I moved into Lo in London in 2011, and then I got married and I live here, but originally I'm, uh, I am Italian. Uh, a fun fact about me, I think it's, uh, let's go back. Uh, I mean, we are we're talking about uh, with the university community. So a fun fact about my university is that uh, a part of my, I spent a year of my study in Lapland, where I learned to build eye glue and uh, reindeer sleds. And my my final examination was a reindeer sledge race, and the first one I've got the best of a degree vote. So that's uh, that's a fun thing about me. Hi everyone, my name is Emmy, and then uh, I'm originally from Indonesia, but. Uh, I'm although I'm dialing in from Canberra, Australia, but currently I'll say that I'm based in Singapore so far. Uh, one fun fact about me, um, I'd say that I've lived half of my life overseas instead of Indonesia, mainly in China and a few years in the US as well. Thank you, everyone. That was great. So let's start with our questions. First of all, did you always know that you wanted to go into product management as early as the beginning of university? If so, why were you interested? And if not, when and how did you become interested? You start with Nina. Hi everyone. No, I didn't know I wanted to go into product management because I started my first degree in 1991 and it wasn't definitely a thing then. But what I always knew from the beginning of my graduate degrees is that I'd like to add um, real, true, tangible value. And I've always liked and enjoyed through my even childhood, very cross-functional type of activity. So I always wanted to be in charge of everything rather than, um, you know, I was one of these bossy kids organizing everybody around the sand pit. The sand pit. When I found out about product, product, product management was through 
at the start of my career uh, because I started my career uh, after two graduate degrees in 1997. And then through industry exposure, I found out about this role product manager. And I also found out that in some of the then blue chip technology companies, uh, product management career was direct to eventually becoming a CEO. So therefore, again, being the bossy knickers I was then, I said, okay, I want to pursue a career that's going to make me the CEO. Um, and as I said, that started when I first found out about this particular route at that point, only at blue chip technology companies in 97, 98 period. Uh, so like Nina, my uh, initial career was not in business or product management. I started off as uh, my bachelor's in computer science. So I was a hardcore coder when I started my career. Uh, so building products, uh, made me love them. And that's how I, you know, transitioned into product management. Uh, but uh, yes, I did not think when I was like doing my bachelor's in computer science that I will ever be a product manager. I was very much passionate about coding and uh, writing softwares and releasing softwares on time. But then that was the building foundation for me becoming a product manager. So oh, what's happened on my side? So, well, I, my, I started a long time ago. So it was uh, probably 1995 and uh, nobody was talking about product management at the time. There was no, I mean, I remember uh, we were using an early stage browser at the time. So it was very hard to, to associate with product management. When I finished my, my university, and I study product design, so physical product design, building chair, lamp, furniture, this kind of stuff. And, and so it's, uh, that's an interesting degree to, to approach product management because it was about uh, making something that people use and they know how to use it. So there was this aspect of product management. Of course, I miss the, 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 the software aspect because we're talking about product management in the software space here. But... Uh, when I started to work as a designer, I, I suddenly understand that uh, we can do better in terms of decision making. And, uh, and that's what, uh, what I started experiencing in my first job experience, that the decision maker making wasn't the right one. And then, and then I realized it again. And then I wanted to, to, to make it better, these things. And so that's why I start to be conscious and aware of product management because uh, I was imposing myself, okay, there must be a better way to take decision. And the person who take decision be, has to have a, a structured way of doing it that is able to communicate to others. And so that brings me into moving to marketing at the beginning. So I moved from designing to marketing because marketing at the time it was the one who was taking decision. And then, and then from marketing, I move into strategic marketing and then I move into product management. So it was it was a set of step in order to build my awareness of what is product management, but also to understand myself where is the decision making and how can I can I can I be in that position of taking the decision and how can I bring a framework around that? Right. So for me, um, basically, I did my bachelor's in software engineering, but then uh, during my studies, I realized that um, I don't actually want to be a software engineer. So um, at that time, I think um, I started to think um, what kind of major should I go for my master's? And then I found out that there's this um, role called product management. That was, that was when I realized that, oh, I actually can combine uh, my technical knowledge with um, my business knowledge as well, because at that point of time, I decided to go into a business role. Um, that was why uh, that was actually why I wanted to be a product management, uh, a product manager. But the thing is, after I graduated, uh, graduated, I actually got into a lot of business roles, um, like account management or like relationship management as well, like community coordinator. Uh, how I ended up in this um, product management or project management role is mainly because um. My current boss, he saw that I do have the technical knowledge. I still have the expertise as well. I have my um, certificates. That's why he decided to um, give me a shot. So um, that's how I actually uh, finally became um, a product manager or a project manager that I've always wanted to be. Yeah. 
thank you. That was really great. And it was really interesting to hear about everyone's journey into discovering that they wanted to do product management. So moving on to the next question, could you tell us where you attended university? And was there like any university majors, clubs, or activities that contributed to your interest in product management? Uh, yes, well, I attended, so as I mentioned, I have two master's degrees. Uh, my what, what I first started studying first is I studied law for one year um, uh, back in my home country, Bulgaria, which is the Roman system of law. And I transferred out because I loved the law, but then I realized what law practitioners do on a daily basis. And I find that quite much paperwork and, uh, and very restricted. So I went and my second degree is, which I obtained in 1996, is a Master of Science in Industrial Management. Um, which is a cross-functional degree. It exists across a number of countries. For those of you who are based in Europe, it's, it, the, it, the, the German equivalent is called Geschäftsingenieur. In Italy, they call it Ingegnere Industriale. Um, and also in France, they have a similar thing. So it's a cross-functional degree where you pursue um, an engineering um, type of study. In my case, it was ele electronics and programming. And you also pursue an MBA in parallel together. And there's a highly valued, in particular in Germany and Italy, you have a lot of top CEOs in any sort of company, including cosmetics that come with that kind of degree, uh, which is highly valued. Um, and then I pursued, um, I went to an American Ivy League school called Johns Hopkins School of, school of Advanced International Studies. And they have a second master's degree, master of arts in Inter advanced international studies, which was again cross-functional between advanced international economics um, and trade and uh, uh, political science. Strangely enough, the first time I got exposed to product management was in 1996 when I did a four-month international internship with Whirlpool Europe, a white goods manufacturer. So for the first time I got that we were working on a market entry um, assessment into parts of Eastern Europe, which was just opening then. But this is when I got exposed to the function of product management, because it also included we, we went back to the US and we did some executive MBA there uh, by the company. Um, and in summary, what I can say is that definitely the also because I started my product management career 24 years ago, that what, what I found particularly important for product management is to have a breadth of cross functional knowledge um, academically. Um, and indeed, uh, because in some companies, product management, uh, I mean, the most important thing is in some companies from the ones that invented it, like the IBMs and Xeroxes and stuff, it's a business critical function where you progress through business line management into CEO and things like this. Um, in any case, it's always a very cross-functional type of function. And I've noticed in my career that people who come with very one-sided um, education, say they hail strictly from technical background, um, they struggle because again, in this modern day and age, age, unless when I started my career, companies are not really investing so much into training their employees or providing them with robust job descriptions and support. Um, so in summary, and also the other thing is that in number of companies uh, which are in the fast moving consumer goods, there is a role called brand management, and it's exactly what product management does in the technology spectrum, but in uh, fast moving consumer goods, it's called brand management. Nowadays, even the investment and um, managers and hedge funds, they have product managers, but they're not techies, they're people who are quite good on the investment side, they, they, they design investment products and portfolios. Um, so in summary, just to say is that in my experience, uh, product management is a very wide function. In the past 15 years, because of Agile, it has been taken into quite deeply onto the tech delivery, product delivery side. Uh, but where it does require cross-functional appreciation and understanding of the way an entire business value chain works, so therefore I'd recommend, and by pure luck in my experience, as you see, I have, I have enough um, academic background to understand from micro issues to technical issues, to marketing all the way to big 
international um, aspects. Um, and that was definitely very useful. Um, and the second thing is in terms of clubs and societies, nowadays it's very useful to get, and there are a number of also free resources online where you can pursue yourself a small product management course for free or cheaply, so you can understand what it entails. And the second is I'd highly recommend as much as possible, and as those are available, internships are very, very invaluable. So pursuing an internship at any stage of your career um, or where possible, like a student job to be exposed to that function would also be useful to build up your knowledge and understanding if this is really what you want to do and how it is done. And then to also get exposed to how it differs across various companies and industry verticals. Yeah, so uh, I did my, uh, I, go to, uh, I went to Duke University in the US for my master's uh, in business. So that's where, that's where I went to my school. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that contribute to uh, becoming a good product manager at a university. Uh, at, at Duke, uh, we had a number of clubs like product management clubs, uh, where you can go and you can uh, work on ideas from scratch. You can uh, simulate how a real company works uh, and you can build interesting products that could be used. Uh, basically, the, uh, it, it's a startup connect that you work on different startup ideas and then uh, uh, work on real products that you can uh, emulate in your real, real experience when you join an organization. So those clubs at universities definitely help you shape uh, your product management career. Uh, also, I'm uh, pursuing my uh, executive business education from Harvard Business School, and there are a number of resources, number of case studies at, at Harvard, uh, where you can learn about the product journey of different companies, right? So uh, at Harvard, we have a number of case studies. You can uh, go and review those on Harvard Business Review, and uh, you can learn a lot from how IBM started uh, their product journey or how SAP started their product journey or how Google started their product journey. And you can uh, learn a lot from these big uh, companies and their experiences and, uh, and how they started small, but they you know, uh, scale their products efficiently. And, uh, and that's how you can drive a lot of knowledge from uh, their journeys as well. Uh, but please do look out for these product management clubs at universities. And that is one of the factors uh, that led me to Duke because Duke had a very strong product management community uh, and that really helped uh, because product management is not just like uh, reading like books and uh, and uh, methods to uh, crack the interview, but it's also about trying your hands at different products and uh, building uh, them from the scratch so that you can you can know different stages and how you can work at those stages when you actually join a company. So I believe it's me. Uh, okay, so I study again, I repeat again, in 1995. And uh, I study in, in Milan, is in Italy, in Politecnico di Milano, who is one of the best uh, university in Italy for technology. So they have engineer and all the branch of engineer, they have architecture and they have design. So these three technology field. So I study industrial design. So how to build physical product uh, in an industrial way, no and crafty anymore. And then during my start, and this was my first master, then I layered another master at Politecnico di Milano and it was a human computer interaction. So I moved into, into more in the software aspect. And then of course, uh, tons of other course, I learned how to code, I've done a course in coding, I've done a, I've done a master in business, I've done, uh, I, I've done an entrepreneurship master, whatever. But what's uh, at that time at Politecnico di Milano in Italy in the specific time, there weren't any labs of activity labeling themselves as product management. But what I think the university is a great training for is ownership. Ownership is one of the main skills for product manager. I mean, you, you really have this inner driven for ownership when you're, when you're a good product manager. Who doesn't mean fight with everybody, doesn't mean always say no, as they say, but it's, it's, a, it's a very strong driven. And how can you train this driven is to you in the university. And I found this one incredible in university because uh, there are so many other people, you have so many other peers there with you. So every idea you have it, you can scale it very fast and test it in a very big group of people. So that's what I've done. I mean, for example, at the university, I've set up my first uh, digital publishing magazine 
And I create a community of over 1,000 people straight away without marketing needs, just talking with people directly. And you own this one and you see how it, as it works and you train your skill at that one. So, so I think it's um, there were no club. I wasn't lucky enough to do that one, but uh, there are peers, there are the students, and you all have time and you're all have energy to start doing things. So it's the best way to train yourself in that term. Thank you. Um, for me, I did my uh, bachelor's in software engineering in China. So um, I think what I learned there is mainly like how to build a software, how to build an application as well. I learned a lot of technical stuff. Um, and then I continued um, my studies in the US, San Francisco, USA, um, in international business, but I took a minor in project management. So um, during that period, I actually learned a lot of things on the, on a more um, project management way. So I learned how a project works, like uh, mainly the waterfall method and uh, other stuff as well. But then uh, remembering that I do have a technical side instead of only the business side, I actually took uh, an extra course in product management. That's when I finally know like how to really gauge and how to really understand um, the difference between project and product. Um, what really helped me is that um, during my courses as well, and uh, during my interactions with people, including uh, during my university's time and during my uh, current role as well, is that it's really important to understand what people are trying to say, because most of the time, since they are not really technical or maybe they are not really like product or project managers, they just mentioned that they want this thing. But uh, I learned that sometimes what they say may, may not be what they really want or might, uh, might not be what they really need. So um, being in universities uh, with this kind of um, courses, I really think that it's really um, your time to understand how to know what's the hidden meaning behind their words. Because like I mentioned, for people, sometimes they just mention, oh, I want to eat. But then why do you want to eat? The main reason is because you're hungry. Yeah. So um, as a product or project manager, that's what you really need to know. Because you're because this user like or this stakeholder is hungry, that's why they want to eat. So I really think that um, with that opportunity, um, you just need to learn really well, like what are people trying to say for real? Thank you, everyone. So there seems to be a variety of degrees in, between our panelists today. Um, I've heard software engineering, I've heard computer science, I've heard business. So what was the process of getting your degree or degrees like for you? And did you find the process challenging? If so, are there any useful sources that helped you? That was Nina. Uh, I didn't find, as I said, because I changed from law into industrial management. <laughs> so luckily I had very supportive parents who always fostered my curiosity. Um, so the, the, the first part of my degree, so the first, including the law, seven years, um, I didn't find it challenging. What it attracted me because that I pursued my degree at the top technical university in Bulgaria, and at that point, including in Europe, Technical University Sofia. What attracted me to the degree is that I wanted to go more in the business direction, also because my parents were economists working for the government and stuff. So a bit of a you know family kind of understanding what it is. But what attracted me to that particular degree, because I had a choice of where to transfer, it was it was a cross-functional degree. I was a bit of a techie myself, you know, I'm of that generation that perused and was excited about the first Atari games, consoles, and then we had handhelds, we swapped with people with just one game. So what I liked for my degree was that it was cross-functional. It was something very new, even for the university, um, to combine a business with uh, engineering and specifically was strictly electronics and uh, software pro programming and informatics. And I found that very exciting uh, because uh, though I also found what I tell you the truth, I found very challenging having gone out of high school and spent one year at law I found very challenging the very advanced mathematics. So for the first two years of my degree, I had to take private tuition in advanced mathematics. 
because including we studied chaos theory and application for report for management science and stuff. So what I found then very challenging is, you know, when you stay one year out of high school, spend time on law, including Latin and such things. And then I went into the, I really struggled, but as I said, I pursued for two years, I was taking uh, private tuition three times a week to keep up with the mathematics. <laughs> um, and then my second degree, which is by Johns Hopkins, um, the only thing which was challenging is that I knew at one point that I, I halfway for my first degree that I'd like to pursue this particular degree because I was very interested in the wider aspects of macroeconomics and political science. I was really interested in the way and because I was involved in, in political activism and international development work myself on a volunteering basis. So I found that very interesting. And at that time, people like myself with business degrees were thrown upon at the likes of World Bank and IMF and the larger non for profits So I thought it'd be useful to get this particular degree. So what was challenging for me coming from a little country like Bulgaria, and there were no scholarships available and et cetera, was first and foremost. So for basically for three, four years, I strictly pursued knowing that I want to apply this set, there was set of universities in the US uh, basically Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, and Columbia, which had programs that I wanted to pursue. And for four years, I was building up my CV and experience to A, be able to be considered in the first place, and second, to be able to secure a scholarship from the graduate school itself. Because in my country at that point, there were no scholarships, um, and my parents couldn't afford crazy tuition. Um, so, but that was also good. It was also useful because it focused my attention because I knew in my particular case, throughout my studies, it was kind of organized towards doing that. And I'm, I'm very privileged. I was successful to secure offers and um, scholarships from all three schools based on, based on building that CV and making net, networking and all the sorts of things I did. Um, and that was funny then because I, had that, I hadn't realized, going back to my struggles in private tuition with, with uh, for advanced mathematics, I hadn't realized that for the portion of John Hopkins, which is advanced monetary theory and macroeconomics and stuff, it's shed loads of advanced mathematics. So it's very bizarre without me realizing that all this you know, sweat and money spent on private tuition would help me then when, when I went to Johns Hopkins. So I was able to make some money on the side from some fellow students in, in giving them tuition to be able to deal with the courses. But that was a bit the law of un, unintended consequences, but it was quite, quite interesting. So in summary, in, on both throughout my uh, uh, graduate studies, of course, there was a bit of a challenge. There's always a challenge, but it prepares you very well. I'm grateful that both my degrees and the particular Johns Hopkins, which is very competitive. And for those of you who studied in the US, um, it prepared me for the real world. Because once you go out of academia and you get a job and stuff, um, it prepares you for real world situations and real world rivalries and real world challenges, even when you start a job. So ultimately, uh, looking back, uh, all the challenges I met um, and the four years I spent being very focused on building my CV and profile so I can land those, any of those top three schools and get scholarship, it was extremely useful. Yeah. Uh, so the process of getting a degree. So the process of getting a degree is different in different countries, right? I remember uh, when I was preparing for my uh, bachelor's of engineering in computer science in India, it was through an entrance exam. So it's like plain, simple, you write an exam, uh, based on your scores, uh, you can apply it to the top universities and uh, then you can choose your majors, right? So for example, if you are choosing computer science, then you have to score relatively higher because it was a branch uh, in demand at that time. Uh, but then talking about the process of getting into a US university like Duke, which is among the top universities in the US, uh, it will not be just your GRE, GMAT, or TOEFL scores because uh, they, they look beyond that. They look beyond the numbers. They look uh, basically why you want to apply to their university, your statement of purpose, and your letter of recommendations. So you should have a very strong background and a case 
of why you want to study in that particular university. Same is true for other universities like Harvard as well. And uh, your statement of purpose should reflect that what you would do after getting a degree uh, from that university. Uh, what are your passions like? Are you just doing the degree for the sake of getting a master's or you're really passionate about uh, that particular uh, coursework that you'll be studying or dedicating your next two years in? So it was quite different. Uh, the both experience was were quite different, but there are a ton of resources. If you talk about uh, GRE or GMAT or TOEFL, there are a number of like free online resources that you can like refer to. Uh, it's not very hard because it's basic aptitude plus a little bit of English uh, communication that gets you through these examinations. But the hard part is building your profile. It's really like because you have to gain some experience in the field that you're doing your master's in. Uh, bachelor's is pretty simple because you're out of high school, you write an exam and then you get into university, but master's uh, is basically how your CV is looking like after two or three years of your work experience. And that contributes heavily into your statement of purpose and your letter of recommendations that you get from different uh, sources. So uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a long and uh, I will not say challenging, but it was an interesting journey but it's not difficult and uh, you know if, if i can study at duke nina can study at john hopkins we can make uh, to any universities as well yeah on, so on my car on my case i uh, what drew me to the university and how can I, how did i arrive at university and the and the challenge i find so mm, I finished the high school with uh, excellent score. I was an excellent student, finished high school. My high school study were pretty generic, what is called liceo scientifico in Italy, who give you solid general knowledge. I have no idea about what I want to do. I have no idea about this word passion, where it was. A lot of things I like it, but there was no connection with really a study field in somehow. Uh, and and also because the school was generic, uh, it, I didn't know my skill, what I was very good at skill, because I think you can go with skill or with passion. If you have a strong passion, that's fine, you can compensate with skill. If you don't have passion or you don't know your passion, go with your skiller, where you're strong it, and you can get the passion for that. This is, uh, for example, trading aspect. Uh, didn't get anything of that. So, so, so when I chose the university, I was like, okay, I know exactly what this university means. I know exactly what this other university means. So it's, I knew exactly, for example, what engineer means. And at the time, engineers were not really creating funny stuff, fun stuff. There wasn't the startup world. There wasn't technology product. Actually, they were making a strange infrastructure that nobody talked about it uh, at the time. And, uh, and then there was the architecture. Uh, and because I knew that I was going... I was good at math. I was good at drawing. I was a pretty creative person. So I know the things I was like, okay, I want to do something in engineer architecture, but I mean, that's a real fun. And so I chose for the one where there was most unknown was the design aspect. So my decision was like, okay, let's go for a university where I don't know things and they may surprise me. <laughs> Ooh, I, I, I'm not suggesting to choose in this way, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was uh, that was my approach, and uh, but 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 actually I was pleased and surprised after I started my study because it was um it was it was technical knowledge uh, and but there was a lot uh, about uh, really prototyping and testing in real time and that I really love it I, I love it that actually we were shipping things it wasn't just theoretical it wasn't just acquiring knowledge but it was try to ship things that at the time it was very rare and very difficult to do to obtain that one so that's uh that was my what what drew me was basically curiosity what drew me into the university and uh, at the moment what i would suggest uh, to, to my daughter instead is to don't have the same approach i had <laughs> what i would suggest to my daughter is actually because we don't really need university nowadays somehow. I mean, you can have access to information everywhere you want it. Aim for the best university. 
really try to get the best university because it's not about the information, it's about the network you're building, it's about the prestige of the university, it's about challenging yourself as much as you can. So, and, 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 and all information, we have internet, so everything is accessible that you can find. So aim for the best university because, uh, be, because it can give you more opportunity after all. That's, uh, that's regarding me. Okay, so um, because I did my bachelor's in China, um, I think um, the main challenge mainly for international students back then would be the language. Uh, although I didn't really have that issue because I technically grew up there. Um, but I think it's the same idea with what Nabil shared. In China, a lot of universities, they will prepare their own entrance exams. So um, preparing for that, I think will also... Um, depend on which major that you're going. So those universities will just prepare different exam papers for di different uh, majors as well. So that was quite challenging depending on the major that you picked. Like for me, um, for my university, I think um, the paper weren't very hard, so it was okay. So that part was fine. Um, but I find it very challenging when I decided to go to the U.S. for my master's because uh, that was my first time that um, entering a, new, a university that the university um, professors need to really interview you. Like what Nabil shared again, like uh, they are going to ask you, like, why are you coming to the U.S.? Why are you applying for our university? Why are you choosing this major? So um, it was quite challenging because previously I did all my educations, like most of them are in Chinese. So I think uh, I needed to really change the way I think things. Um, you know, in the Asian culture, we are taught to be very modest, like uh, lay low, like you cannot really stand out. But what I found out is that um, in the Western culture is that you really need to show what you can do, show your skills, show your expertise, so to me, it's very challenging to change like how you live basically. But luckily yeah, I got to different universities that I applied to, uh, but I decided to go to HALT mainly because of the intensive uh, program. So I finished my master's in one year. Um, I think nowadays, uh, what kind of resources that's helpful is that you can find a lot of them online. Like if you're interested in one thing, you can just search. There are a lot of like free resources that you can find. For example, like YouTube. Nowadays, people are uploading videos to YouTube and then uh, like Udemy as well. Or if you are going for very specific courses, there are tons of resources out there or tons of organizations or um, companies that are willing to give out certificates. Like maybe marketing, you can just go to Google or go to Meta as well. Mm, I think during school period, it will be really good if you spend the time to do research and find what kind of resources that you can um, use to build up your skills as well. Um, and networking, like what Dario mentioned, just go, try to go to top universities because it's really helpful because that's really where and when you need to start building your network. Okay, moving on to career-related questions. Where are you currently working and could you give us a brief rundown of your average day and what that looks like? Hi, um, I'm afraid I'm on a health-related sabbatical, but I can tell you my last role was a, a global head lead product manager at the multinational company Experience PLC. Uh, and my day job, was all over the place. But the thing I wanted to mention that it very much depends on your seniority, like in any type of job function, when you're more junior, your role will be much more focused. Um, and if it isn't, you shouldn't take up that job because whatever you study at university, and even if you've done a bunch of internships, when you go into a company, it would have its own rules, procedures, um, and culture which are official, but there's also the real way of getting things done, which is unofficial. So just a warning is that some of us on the line, we've been through a long experience and we're quite senior. So what we tell you would be about our day job, but I also try very briefly to tell you, at least when I manage people, what I start with the most junior ones. So at Experian PLC and eight was a global role, 
my role was combined between, and it has a specularity, whereas the company was moving from highly specialized on-premise, very high secure banking and financial services application to the cloud. So it was a combination of uh, pure market development and understanding because also each market where we operated because it's operating in the banking and financial sectors has its own very particular regulations. So although you can in theory have a universal software backend, uh, even at the back end, you have to cover certain very strict end market and user regulations. So it was pure market development understanding market development needs and requirements um, in the combination of the commercial aspects of those and then users, but very much also about local regulations, because in, in this kind of industry and in vertical, part of the role of, the role of a top supplier, blue chip like Experian, is that you also bring the regulatory awareness into your uh, um, customer quite often. And it's still a competitive advantage compared to more lightweight techie based startup so that was one big part second big part was uh, on a more commercial um, aspect formulating value propositions uh, 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 pricing and go-to-market strategies which was heavily challenged because I was also a PL profit and loss owner which was quite also challenging because you'd need to manage that against um, your, your unit costs, because at my time at Experian, they didn't have the funds to be able to subsidize their go to market. So we had to make already at the onset certain level of, of, of margin. Mm -hmm. Third big part was um, overseeing uh, various aspects of technical development and delivery, all the way from design into, into delivery. And there were different aspects because you have a complete separate end user view versus middle layer versus back end. There was also quite a lot because the company, like many others, they've been very keen on product management. So they have all sorts of people with all sorts of background labeled product managers. Uh, but where the group of people that I was hired from outside, we were tasked to with two major subject matter expert expertise. One is about cloud and cloud transition and operationally managing the cost side of cloud, which is quite tremendous. And also bringing a bit more robust understanding and specification and um, better way of everybody working in an agreed product management way that fits this particular company uh, way of working and challenges. And all sorts of other things, you know, just don't ask me because I have to work on, on um, end user tutor videos, on front end promotions, just anything where you need to, to cover the basis because in this day and age, very few companies have the luxury to, and budgets to provide headcount for everything that's required in the value chain. But what I would say and what I still try to do with very, very junior type of um, product managers is that you'd probably start, and as again, as I said, when you get the chance to start and also when you do your internship, just look out for being given very clear, specific tasks, because indeed in product management and project management, the key talent is to break down one, you know, saying, how do you eat an elephant bit by bit, but you have to also put the logical sequence of eating the elephant bit by bit. So. The more junior uh, product managers, and some of them start as business analysts, which is not a bad way to start. Um, some of them start as product owners, some of them start as technical product managers or commercial engineers, is they would have much more uh, limited responsibility, maybe for a single feature or for a subset of a feature or maybe just for the technical delivery side, not being marred too much with the economic side, or they might start, start on product marketing side, which is then more spelling out the value proposition of the product rather than the technical aspect, but understanding translating technical features into propositions. So just not to worry that ultimately, in summary, a product management role is very, very wide uh, umbrella. It differs from company to company. Um, 
even with companies with well-established product management function, it would very much differ, differ, very much differ based on the business unit you're in, the and the particular challenges the company has at the moment to meet. So you have to be ready to. Um, it requires basically both sides of the brain. So if you if you don't like this kind of constant change um, and and shape shifting, um, you don't necessarily enjoy it. And that is the key aspect in my experience uh, with product management. So uh, <clears throat> I'm working as a global senior director of SAP and the org that I'm part of is SAP Digital. So our mandate is to bring the new age tools and technologies like AI to the internal and to the to, to the internal workforce and the customers. Uh, I'm also heading the technology and automation for SAP Digital and managing a group of uh, product managers is also one of my uh, functions. So as a functional owner of product management, uh, the day in life starts with, uh, you know, looking at the technology stack that I'm the owner of, right? There are different products that come under my portfolio. So checking the status of each of those product areas, uh, because we work on new age technologies, uh, there's a lot of like process mapping. There's a lot of uh, uh, translating the functional areas into how uh, we can uh, bridge those gaps with AI technologies or AI tools like GPT, for example, right? So uh, a lot of brainstorming goes into my day where we uh, try to bridge those gaps with technologies. Uh, then there are like status reports. Uh, you go, go into different groups. Uh, as Nina said, business case or value proposition is one such activity where you have to justify the cost of uh, you know launching or building a new product or a new or acquiring a new technology. Uh, so. I go into those meetings as well. Uh, then uh, working with designers, uh, also reviewing uh, the design as a product manager should have a great eye for design as well because uh, it, it it matters. And then I also uh, uh, involve myself into technical discussions as well to facilitate and see if we can find solutions to problems that we are stuck at, right? Uh, so in, in general, you do, uh, all these tasks, uh, which are relevant for you as a starting a product manager, uh, prioritizations, talking to designers, talking to technical teams, talking to your customers, talking to your stakeholders, and preparing business cases and PRD documents that uh, goes into the life cycle of the product. So, regarding myself, so my job is. Uh, I am, I'm the owner of uh, a product management consultancy who is called Human and Machine. I have done for many years uh, product management and then at one point five years ago I decided to set up my own product management consultancy. Uh, what I do as a product management consultancy, I provide basically service to organizations who can be startup or are, let's say are in the phase of scaling up or big larger organizations are just the Amazon on that time. The service I provide are mainly around the product management operation, product management coaching for the leadership team, and the product management mindset. So I provided this service on a consultancy base. So my, my day, how does it look? My day to day is in the morning, communication. In the afternoon, communication. In the evening, communication. So it's communication, communication, communication. That's all I do as a product manager, really. And that's uh, that's uh, where the challenge are mainly in product management is. I think the product management that they see failing is because they don't know how to communicate. They don't communicate properly. It's not because they don't have technical knowledge or technical know-how. It's very rare. It's very rare. So, so that's uh, that's basically my day-to-day -day job. And uh, and uh, there's nothing really more about that one except that uh, the the service I see doing mainly are uh, for example i sit down with uh, with the leadership team and help them uh, understanding how to organize and structure product management culture inside the organization or product management operation and all the process inside the organization how to become more data driven for example or i sit down with uh, product management uh, cpo cpo vp director whatever the, you know, every organization has a different title and help them in their leadership challenge around 
how to inspire the team, how to measure performance, how to improve performance, and all of that. And they do that one with conversation. Really, I mean, it, there are there are conversations are what I found it more effective in driving new behavior, in inviting and discovering the problem, for example. And then, of course, uh, after conversation, you, uh, what I tend to do is uh, is documenting because as a product manager, we write documentation. We love to write documentation, but documentation is never standalone. It's uh, just a consequence of what we added with the conversation because and then it's uh, conversation is. It's, you basically perceive something in the conversation and then it goes away. You remember just 1% of the conversation. So that's why we tend to document, I tend to document because so my clients can just go back and find what we've been discussing and maybe apply it in a more meticulous and step-by-step uh, -step way. That's all about me. Um, so currently I act as the uh, tech product and project manager in Weher Hospitality, also known as Y Suites. Um, my day to day mainly will be brainstorming um, based on the conversations that I have with different stakeholders of the product or the projects that I'm handling. So um, from those conversations, again, um, I need to really find out what they need instead of what they want. Um, based on that, I'll come up with some scope and then see on the technical side, like what we can do to make it better, what kind of automation as well, and then how this will impact our product in the future. So um, other than that, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis will be testing of the current cycle that's ongoing, maybe what kind of product that we are currently developing or what kind of features as well, while also thinking and prioritizing for the next cycle. I think mainly um, conversation based as well, because we always need to find out what we can add and how it will impact the current product. Um, because it's a tech product, mainly we maintain a website or um, add a function or try to improve a function. So yeah, main, mainly on my day will be testing or like brainstorming as well. Okay, for this next section, could you please say true or false, plus a short explanation for the statement. The statement is, all the best product management jobs are in San Francisco or the USA. Definitely false. That's false. <laughs> and the rationale is that um, it really depends. I mean, first and foremost, because I've worked for blue chips like Procter and Gamble on technology side when I started, and then Philips internet in a global role, and Samsung. So I've also interfaced and bought was an acquisition side, or interfaced and partnered with San Francisco, California-based companies. Um, so I have a lot of personal experiences. So it is definitely not true because in terms of product management, as I said, if, if we stay strictly in the technology sector, though I mentioned a few other sectors, it really very much depends on a um, couple of things. First and foremost is to learn the skills of product management. It would very much depend on the kind of company and what are they willing, and there's still companies like this who invest time and effort in training their employees and, and making them mature. Um, that's one important aspect. And the second aspect is in terms of uh, technology, it again very much depends what kind of role in technology product, technology related companies uh, product management um, involves you. Because there's a lot of, if you're very much in the very upstream side, there's still a lot of companies around the world that produce really breakthrough, very advanced um, technology. And second is from if you're more into the implementation part the value proposition part of an existing technology and repackaging it into something useful in a certain vertical. Again, there are many companies that are not based in, in, in California and in San Francisco. So my best guide for you would be when you reach that point as to where you want to work is to map out for yourself what kind of industry vertical interests you and then to find within that industry vertical if they are pioneering technology um, so then you'd be involved upstream. So maybe they won't train you too much, but you'll be exposed to really the next big thing. And the second would be then if they are a leader in the market segment that implements some existing technology, 
or even if you wanted to start for a small startup, but in summary, definitely it's not just San Francisco. And just to warn you, for those of you who don't really read much international press or haven't traveled much, uh, living in San Francisco and in California in January, January is absolutely price prohibitive. And you can read yourself on blogs and Facebook and whatever you're reading, how a lot of people with top jobs in companies over there, they can't even afford, afford a flat share. So just one warning is that before you start thinking, oh, the best tech jobs are in California, that's real life. You need to also start calculating what my salary is going to be and am I going to be able to live on it. And California is horribly expensive. So people are moving out of California for the last number of years because of that issue that whatever their salary is, is there is a limit, the, the cost of life is very high and there is very little availability of, of housing. Um, so yeah, that's from my side. Sorry, I was a bit long. So uh, you got cognizant of the time, I'll give a very short answer. Uh, it's false because uh, it depends on where you want to be, uh, to be honest, right? Uh, even in US, the jobs are spread across US now. Uh, uh, San Francisco used to be uh, a hub for tech a few years ago, but now it's been, uh, we have smaller hubs in different regions as well, like Dallas, like uh, North Carolina, RTP area, and so on, right? So uh, the very short answer is uh, absolutely no. For me, it's, uh, well, I'm a product manager, so <laughs> it's like what, how we define best job in product management so because if we define best job in product management as best job for early stage people so people fresh for university did the they just finished their degree and they want to start the product management i think san francisco and us west coast in san francisco is still one of the best place in the sense that uh, there has been a lot of, they, they are the first one to start and there is a lot of culture about growing and organizing operation and product management. Now that say right now is not relevant anymore because most of the company you can work remotely. So there is no really need to be in San Francisco and also most of the knowledge is shared. So the, 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 the company that start to say, so what, what I think is that probably before COVID, if you are fresh for university, and you want to get into product management with the right fit, probably yes, San Francisco was the best place. Right now, after COVID, it's not needed anymore because, uh, because anyway, most of the positions, they work remotely. So it's, uh, it's not needs uh, anymore to be there. I totally agree. So I've stayed in San Francisco. I know how it's like there. Um, but I do think that it's false, especially like what Dario mentioned as well. Nowadays, uh, people can work remotely from anywhere, basically. Even if you really wanted to stay in San Francisco, maybe um, most of the companies there or startups there, they tend to hire remotely. So I don't think that the best jobs are in San Francisco, technically, yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. For the Q&A section, we received one question and due to the time, could you all just briefly provide a short answer? So the question is, which is one advice you would give to your high school self? To myself, I'd give the advice to go slowly, just because I know the answer to help others around me to find it themselves rather than me giving it to them. Uh, for me, uh, love everything that you would do because, uh, you know, at, at high school stage, whenever we are uh, choosing subjects, we pick one subject or the other subject because we like them more. But in the broader course of life, everything is important. So please, uh, uh, if I go back to my high school years, I would really love each and every subject that I'm reading because some of the other way that comes and uh, you use those knowledge in some way or fashion in your life. Okay, so for me, an advice that I will give to my younger self, uh, it would be stop trying to be the best. There's always someone better than me, but try to be myself. So try to be the only one. Focus on be the only one and not on be the best. That's the advice I give to my young self. 
um, for me, I'd say that um, it's good if you know what you want to be or which direction you're going. But then um, I'd say it's okay to take your time and just try to figure it out because you're young. You do have the time to try and find out which role or which direction that you'd like instead of just rushing through a role that ended up you'll suffer in or not you enjoy. Yeah. We are at the end of our time, but thank you so much to our panelists for spending the time today. Wonderful insight into the rest of areas to specialize in, what the key highlights are, as well as some of the things to watch out for. So thank you so much for being so open and honest. Thank you also to the viewers. I am sure you can all agree that our amazing panelists have done a fantastic job and provided some crucial information to guide decision making around your next steps. Once again, if you need any help with university or career guidance, to check out our website and Instagram. With that said, one last huge thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks.